Hello, my name is Geir Eide and welcome to Semiconductor 360 Live 2021. And in this session, we are going to talk about the new streaming scan network uh, technology. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to just take a little step back and talk about some of the IC design trends that, that affect test. Now, needless to say, design sizes are continuing to, to grow. Um, but really, the interesting part is that this growth happens while the number of I.O. pins that we can reuse for scan tests, general purpose I.O.s, that number is, is stable or sometimes even uh, shrinking. And the reason for that is that more and more of the pins are used for, for high-speed pins. And for tests, this means more data has to go through uh, the same or a smaller pipe. Now, it's not just a gate count that is, is growing, it's also the, the complexity of the design architecture itself. There's more cores, uh, more complex hierarchies, cores within cores. And at the same time, we also see um, some uh, like uh, changes in the adjacent design disciplines that also affect DFT. So for instance, tile designs is something that impacts how we route the chip level test signals in, inside the chip. Uh, we also see, well, a phenomenon that we've seen for, for a long time, really, especially in, uh, in GPUs, is something we see now in more and more in other uh, design categories, especially in AI accelerators, for instance. And that is larger numbers of identical cores, huge numbers of identical cores in sometimes. And um, speaking of AI, any new uh, segment uh, within any new segments, right now it's AI, tomorrow it's going to be something else. Time to market is a especially important factor. Um, it's always in, in new markets, it's always a race to be the first um, and, and a dominant player. And you don't want to be in that critical path. You don't want DFT to be in, in that critical path. So what, what do these trends really mean to, to DFT? Well, most designs today are implemented with, with some sort of hierarchical DFT approach like we see in this little, uh, this simple drawing, um, hierarchical approach where the testability, DFT insertion, and also pattern generation is done at the block level or core level. And then uh, at chip level, these, um, uh, we, are, we connect the core level uh, test pins to, to chip level pins. This is usually done through some sort of um, pin muxed um, approach, and then the patterns are, are retargeted. Um, now, the, when um, when the industry transitioned from from a flat approach to a hierarchical approach, this this provided many benefits. But now, with the increase, significant increase in complexity, even this approach is is running out of steam. Uh, some of the challenges we have to deal with here is that a, a lot of the decisions that impact uh, test time and, and test cost have to be done at design time. Just to take a simple example, for instance, deciding which course you can test in parallel, that depends on how this, this uh, MUX circuitry is configured. Um, a decision you have to make at design time, for instance. Um, we also see, again, there are lot, lots of, of dependencies here between the different cores. For instance, two cores that are tested in parallel should have about the same scan chain length. Um, if we are not good at, at balancing these dependencies, um, we will have a uh, result in increased test cost and test waste. Uh, similarly, we have to balance the uh, chip level resources and, and the core level resources. And with uh, more complex designs, more groups of cores, sets of cores that are tested at the same time, uh, you, know, you see the dependency of, of all of these different things, it makes things even worse with even bigger designs. Now, while the uh, design size grows, the function of frequency of the designs grow, one thing that really hasn't changed much over the last 10, 20 years is the actual shift speed. So how, how fast we can shift data through, through the scan chains. And what's interesting is that the limiting factor here typically is not the tester, it's not the IOs, it's typically the shift registers or the scan chains themselves. And on top of that, with some of these new design trends, we talked about um, AI designs with huge numbers of identical cores, combining that with tiling, even broadcasting, 
uh, test input data to a large number of identical cores is challenging uh, because you have to deal with, with different pipeline stages, something that's more complex with, uh, with tiling. And also on the output side, again, with huge numbers of identical cores, leveraging the, uh, the fact that these cores are identical is, is challenging. Um, and um, a result of, of this is that many DFT engineers and, and DFT managers have to make uh, compromises. Uh, for instance, we talked about some of these decisions that impact test cost. Um, you can, well, to, to simplify the whole story a bit, you can either, for instance, have a straightforward design flow. You determine, for instance, how many scan channels each core would have. You determine which cores should be able to test in parallel very early in the design flow. And, and, and as a result, you may pay for that in, uh, in wasted bandwidth because you're not able to, to balance this properly. Uh, the other approach is that uh, you can go back and iterate side effect with this is that now you have a much more complex design uh, DFT flow, but you save uh, on, on test time. So when we started to develop SSN, the streaming scan network, we set to, uh, to address many of these challenges. And what SSN or streaming scan network is, it is a new way to distribute scan test data across an SLC or across an IC. Uh, the basic idea here is that we, we still do DFT hierarchically. We insert DFT and generate patterns at core level. But what changes is how we access the DFT resources at the core and how we distribute the data. Uh, with this approach, there's now a uh, what you call an SSN bus. So this is a, a bus that then connects the scan, the chip level scan input pins, to, to a core and then connects one core to the next. And inside the cores, there is now what we call a host node. And this node picks up the right data from the bus and sends it to the scan input uh, pins of the core. Uh, it collects the scan outputs and put that uh, data back onto, onto the bus. Uh, and also that this host generates the DFT signals like scan clock, scan enable, uh, and so forth locally, and, and that's key. We'll, we'll get back to why later. And last but not least, this network is configurable. What, what that means is that we, can, um, we, we don't have to make all of these decisions that we talked about earlier at design time. For instance, we don't have to determine which course we should set the uh, test in parallel at design time. That uh, decision can be made at the pattern retargeting time. So the, the key here is that this uh, technology uh, also decouples a lot of the dependencies, the core level dependencies and the chip level dependencies. For instance, we, can, um, we don't have to uh, correlate the number of scan channels at the core level with the number of pins, chip level pins. We can configure compression at the core level for what gives you the best compression when you just look at the core by itself. And you determine the width of the SSN bus based on how many chip level pins are available uh, for scan test. And the fact that you, you can completely decouple these things reduces the DFT implementation time. At the same time, we're able to address many of the routing and, and timing closure challenges because the, the architecture is very different than, than a pin max approach. And this is all done while also minimizing test time and test data volume. Uh, I mentioned that one of the you know, key um, advantages here is that we can optimize the core level compression. We don't have to um, determine how many uh, uh, core level scan channels we should use based on, on the chip level resources. Um, this really means that you, you can achieve much better core level compression than what you otherwise can. And on top of that, there are some additional technologies within SSN that helps reduce test data time and volume. And, and we'll get back to that. But, but first, let's talk a little bit about how this actually works. And to do that, let's look at an even simpler design. In this case, we have a design with, with two cores, uh, core A with five scan channel inputs, five scan channel outputs, and core B with four scan channel inputs and, and four scan channel outputs. And in this design, we have configured the 
SSN bus to be 8 bits wide. Again, the, the width of this bus is determined by how many chip level pins we have available to, to reuse for test. Now, what this means is that in this case, to, if we want to test core A and B at the same time, uh, we need a total of nine bits of data. And that, those nine bits, so the, the amount of data we need to perform a, a shift cycle for all of the cores we test in parallel, we refer to that as a packet. And in this case, the packet size is bigger than the size of the bus. And this is, this is typical in SSN. And what that means is that we need more than one SSN bus cycle to be able to perform shift in both of the cores. In this case, you will notice that um, the last bit of a packet is um, the, the first bit of the second SSN bus cycle. Then, um, the, for the second packet, now you will notice that the, the position of the different uh, bits, so where the bits for core A are located, that, that's rotated, right? And the neat thing about this is then is that these host nodes understand this rotation. They know that uh, for uh, different SSN bus cycles, that location of the data is different. And that's all based on that initial programming of the, of the SSM uh, circuitry. And this again allows us to have nothing but payload on, on the SSN bus. And again, this rotation will, will continue packet by packet. And for the scan output data, we will then reuse the same slots uh, just two packets later. So this, the, the, the slots that were used to uh, for scan input for for one core is are reused for the scan output data, and and again the SSN hosts uh, are then automatically figure out where to to pick up the data and where to put the data back on on the bus. So this this rotation, this the way the data is packetized that that keeps the the data and uh, on on the bus compact. Uh, but there are a couple of other advantages to, to SSN uh, as well. One is uh, what we call independent shift and capture. And in, in most uh, you know, traditional methods, when you test multiple cores in parallel, you have to align capture cycles. What that means is if the scan chains have different length, there's some padding and, and waste per load, per scan patterns. With SSN, since we generate the signals locally, we don't, we don't have that waste. We can, we, can, uh, you know, uh, we can pack the data more efficiently. Now, there are certainly some pattern types where you do want to have in, uh, a line capture like X-Test, IDDQ. And, and in they, those cases, you, you can do that also with SSM, but for, for the majority of, of the patterns, you will leverage the ability to have independent shift and capture. Um, now this, you know, what we just talked about that deals with uh, padding per pattern, but what about the scenario where the number of scan patterns required to test each core is different? Um, and that's what we see in, in this example here. There's uh, one, many cores are tested in parallel. One core has way more patterns than the majority. And, and as a result, and you know, once you're done testing these other cores, the, the pins assigned to those uh, are, are just sitting there, basically. Now, with, with SSN, we have a capability we call bandwidth tuning, and that changes some of the things I talked about in the previous slide. So you know, I told you that the size of the packet is determined by the, you know, the number of scan channels for all of the cores that we are testing in parallel. But let's assume that, and again, the same example as we looked at on the previous slide, that core B has significantly fewer scan patterns than, than core A. So what SSN will do automatically in this case is instead of allocating four bits per packet to core B, it can, can starve it and uh, let's say allocate three bits or two bits instead. That makes the uh, the packet, uh, the packet smaller. It, it does that, and also means that you require more packets before core B is is complete. But that that will kind of align the resources, and you ended up with with a situation what like what we see here to the very right side of the screen. That now the cores that are tested in parallel will complete 
almost at, at the same time. Not exactly, but much closer than what we would otherwise be able to do. Um, now, as you've noticed, also a, the packet size is usually, you know, the, or the entire packet could take multiple, uh, uh, multiple SSN bus cycles. And as a result of that, we're, uh, we're able to shift the uh, data across the SSN bus at a higher frequency than, than what the limit is for the core. So let's say we still have a 100 megahertz limit for the core. That's the fastest you can shift data through the scan chains inside of the core. What we can do with SSN then is still operate the, the bus at a much higher frequency based on the limitation uh, on the tester or your IOs. So as one example, we can, for instance, shift the IOs at 200 megahertz. We can, to, to reduce the width of the bus, we could uh, use what we call a bus frequency uh, multiplier and bus frequency divider nodes to then um, re uh, shift the actual bus uh, at, let's say, uh, 400 megahertz, as an example, and to have a, a narrower bus and, and ease routing, and then shift at 100 megahertz locally. Um, so again, this allows you to, to optimize the shift frequency and optimally reduce the overall test time. The last capability I want to touch on is um, a capability within SSN to deal with identical cores. And with identical cores, we have an option to, to add what we call on-chip compare circuitry um, as part of the, of the SSN nodes inside each core. And what that allows us to do is to, um, you know, rather than just shift in, in the scan input data through the SSN bus, we shift in the scan input data, the expect data, and mask data per core. Now, so this amount of data, what we shift in, that's the same amount independent of whether you have six identical cores or a thousand identical cores, right? Because one, one set of input expect and mask would cover any number of identical cores. Then what this on-chip compare circuit does is to do the comparison locally. Uh, we shift out accumulated status for all of the cores and also individual uh, pass-fail flags uh, per core. And this can reduce the overall uh, test time and test data volume for designs with identical cores. Now, SSN uh, as a technology was introduced uh, just a few months ago at the International Test Conference in, in ITC. And you know, one thing I would just like to, to mention here at the end is that even though this is new technology was just announced, we had worked with many semiconductor partners for, uh, for many years uh, prior to this launch. And the reason we did that is that we know that with Technology like this that uh, really uh, results in significant changes in your DFT methodology, it's really important that it's validated, demonstrated, proven before uh, it gets adopted. So that's why we worked with a number of, of partners. We published some of the results as part of the launch at ITC, and we do at this time have multiple um, silicon devices, multiple tape outs, that demonstrates the effectiveness and also uh, value and, and uh, stability of, of the SSM technology. Um, if you have any further questions about this technology, I would also uh, uh, suggest that you uh, visit our website where we have more detailed information available. And I will also be available uh, for the Q&A if you have questions for me. So with that, um, thank you very much for joining us here at Semiconductor 360, and thank you very much uh, for your time.